Greetings, everyone. My name is Adil Najm, and I am the Dean of the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies here at Boston University. We are delighted to have all of you with us. And uh, thank you for joining. If you're joining live, thank you for viewing, if you're going to view this later. But I am joined today with a number of my faculty colleagues from the Pardee School. And we are going to discuss how the US elections in general, but in particular the 2020 elections, how are they being viewed by those outside of the US? How does the rest of the world look at these elections, the process, the results, the implications, how we do it, and how do they respond? And with me today are a number of my wonderful colleagues, colleagues from the party school. We have Professor Eric Goldstein. We have uh, Professor Zoliswa Mali. We have Professor Manjri Chatterjee Miller, we have Professor Vesko Garsevich, and we have Professor Jorge Heine. And we're going to take a, a tour of the entire world, the length and breadth of it, from one time zone to the other. And I'm straight going to go straight to my colleagues and ask them to begin a conversation on what they think the world is thinking, feeling as they look at these elections. And uh, maybe I should start with uh, Professor Goldstein um, since he, he has spent a lot of time in Britain and he will be our BBC correspondent, Eric. Thank you very much for that. And I'll, I'll start with the BBC uh, because the BBC through its global uh, network through the World Service was probably sort of one of the greatest sources of news around the world for what was happening but it was also reflecting what was happening in the British media. And in the lead up to the election, it was interesting. Maybe it was the pandemic situation, other problems, but there was a lot of news story about the election and the problems that people were confronting. The thoughts that there would be violence, the thoughts that there would be upheaval, uh, the thoughts that there might be chaos. Uh, and then suddenly the election happens. It's relatively calm. It becomes a relatively unexciting story of counting of ballots, uh, and how that all works, uh, the drama perhaps of the next uh, few days, but slowly it's shifted to what does the incoming administration mean and what the implication of a Biden election is going to mean. The papers, by the way, in Britain were also divided, uh, also polarized society in some ways politically between Brexiteers and non-Brexiteers, and they were mirror imaging that in the American election. And there was a strong group within the conservative end, the Brexiteer end, that was looking for a, a Trump victory, hoping that a Trump victory would solve some of the political problems confronting Britain today. And this has had a dramatic impact in the last 48 hours in London, where there's a political upheaval going on inside the prime minister's office at Downing Street, where there's a struggle for power going on for the future of Britain because they realize they now have to adapt to a Biden presidency with a very different agenda. And they're trying to reshuffle the deck to perhaps work with the new administration. And this has implications for future relationship with Europe, with NATO, and also the Irish issue, which they know is very close to uh, the new administration's heart, but also politically significant. In the other bits that they looked at, it just wasn't the presidential election that was being explained and discussed in Britain, but also the uh, results in Congress and the implications of Britain for that. So there has been a tremendous engagement with the American election, not just out of curiosity, but for the implications for Britain uh, and for a wider British world. Yeah. Th thank you, Eric. And, you know, I, I always find it interesting how much of a spectator sport the US elections are for the rest of the world. And not just a spectator sport, but in serious ways, I've sometimes wondered if the rest of the world should get a fractional vote you know, maybe a tenth of a vote, because what happens in the U.S. election does impact uh, the rest of the world. And that is the reason, uh, or one of the reasons. Uh, Manjri, maybe we should move to Asia and give, give us a sense of how, how the elections were viewed. And we'll come back to everyone and connect these dots. But what's the view from Asia? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, Adil, I completely agree with you. I mean, this this unofficial, you know, um, unofficially stated Pax Americana uh, means that everybody is always very anxious about U.S. elections alongside the Americans. 
Um, so um, in uh, you know the countries I work on in China and India, the reactions were were quite uh, different and the anxieties were quite different. So um, it, China actually, as of today, has congratulated President uh, Elect Biden on his win. It waited quite a while, but it was very careful uh, uh, when uh, they issued congratulations. They also said that at the same time that the U.S. elections must be confirmed uh, based on law and order. So uh, you know, so that careful statement was put out by uh, by the government. But at the same time, if you look at Chinese media, uh, the Global Times today has a very, very strident editorial, uh, which calls uh, Trump crazy and uh, talks about how, um, uh, you know, he just signed a post-election executive order that bans U.S. investors from investing in 31 Chinese firms that have been linked to the Chinese military. And then, of course, Secretary of State Pompeo uh, just came out and talked about how Taiwan was not a part of China and had not been recognized as a part of China since the Reagan administration, uh, which, of course, is you know, designed to really ramp up the anxiety levels uh, in Beijing. So, uh, so on one hand, uh, you know, for the Chinese government, a Biden administration would certainly uh, prove more stable. Um, and they believe that it's a more predictable kind of administration that they can deal with. They know what to expect. Uh, and that they would conform to existing norms, including treading carefully um, you know, around Taiwan and stay away from bombastic statements. Uh, on the flip side of this, uh, it is also true that uh, you know, Chinese elites believe that the United States is declining. And uh, because it's declining, not, not only that it's declining, but that the Trump administration uh, has done more in the past four years uh, than any other, other administration to actually accelerate that decline. So there's just a lot of complicated um, emotions uh, on the Biden administration coming in. Stability on one hand, but on the other hand, uh, the Trump administration in China's view was very good for American decline and uh, rise of China. In India, it's been a little bit different. In India, uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, was very careful to rush in and congratulate uh, President-elect Biden uh, with a tweet. Uh, he also separately uh, congratulated uh, uh, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris, who is of both South Asian and um, African-American descent. Uh, and he hoped that that would lead to closer ties. Um, so again, here, uh, the calculation is a little bit different because uh, the US-India relationship has been progressing. Um, and that being said, in the last four years, under the Trump administration, it's progressed in leaps and bounds. And that isn't so much the Trump administration as the border clashes that India has had with China. Uh, so that has led to India being much more willing uh, to actually rapidly engage with uh, the US on a strategic partnership on many different levels. I mean, if we look at the last uh, three years, there was a defense agreement signed, you know, one defense, uh, defense agreement signed per year, which is, which is huge. Um, in 2018, they began the two plus two strategic dialogue, which is one of now the highest levels uh, dialogues ever institutionalized uh, and with uh, the US, US India administrations. Uh, and they had these uh, joint military exercises last year, which were the first ever tri service, so ground, naval, and air forces uh, exercise with the United States. So here you have a Trump administration that has been very, very good uh, for the Indian government. They've been very eager to embrace it, very eager to take on, um, uh, take on the strategic partnership. Um, and so the question with the Biden administration becomes, well, are they going to continue this and continue this without any reference to democratic values, uh, which was really not a concern for the Trump administration. So when President like Biden comes in, is he going to talk about human rights? Is he going to talk about Kashmir? Is he going to talk about the Citizenship Act? Um, all of which are uh, domestic politics issues that the Modi administration absolutely does not want to discuss um, with any US administration. Um, but again, there's a flip side to that. The flip side to that is that the Biden administration, similar to the Chinese government's uh, view, would also bring more stability, right? So one of the things that the Trump administration did was it really gutted the State Department. So if you look at uh, the South Asia uh, bureaucracy now in the State Department, um, in fact, in the entire four years of the Trump administration, there was no Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Affairs. Um, there was an acting Assistant Secretary of State who was Alice Wells who retired in August. Um, there is still no US ambassador to Pakistan. Uh, the Charge d'Affaires uh, is the acting ambassador to Pakistan. Uh, the US ambassador to India was not appointed until the end of 2018. So a, a Biden administration would almost certainly uh, bring back people and plug those holes, which in turn would, would pad the relationship.
Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I'll move to Vesco and sort of the view from, from, from mainland Europe and, and also uh, all parts of Europe. But one of the interesting things, especially in Asia, just to add to what Manji was saying is how, how much how how elaborately it was reported. I, I was on that night in on, on on television channels in three different Asian countries and they had elaborate sets. It was like not not live coverage, it was like live transmission, as if nearly it was their own election. And and uh, and and one of the things that people always get intrigued by is not just the what but the how. Of, of, of that process. It's every four years, this tutorial in, in a different way to doing elections. Uh, how, how is it in, in, from Europe, Vesco? Uh, I would say that uh, uh, Europe was very much interested and uh, all the whole continental Europe was, was very much interested in uh, the outcome of the elections uh, in, uh, uh, in the US, not just presidential, but also elections for Senate, the Senate and the Congress. Uh, rarely have regional media, uh, media from the region I come from, have been so interested in a US presidential race, uh, with many of them offering unprecedented wide range 24 seven coverage uh, of uh, what's going on in the US. I would say that uh, people, if they watched carefully, would have learned, uh, oh, learned more about the U.S. elections that was going on in Wisconsin or Pennsylvania or in Arizona than in their own countries. Just before our meeting or event uh, began, I checked news and I saw in one of local media a, break, uh, a breaking news. Uh, Arizona has been called for, uh, for uh, President-elect Biden. You know, this didn't happen before, but it speaks, in my view, two things. First of all, that um, it is yet another confirmation of how global the world has become, and hopefully with the pandemic going on, that will lead us to more coherent global cooperation in the future. And the secondly, uh, you know, many countries in Central and Eastern Europe are recognized for the rise of populism and populist government in, in, in place, so that President uh, Trump's populist rhetorics his uh, flamboyant style and ambiguous statements about the far right movement. Uh, I think this uh, resonates well with uh, nationalistic and chauvinistic narratives in some parts of Europe. And in their minds, uh, present times re-election would be an encouraging sign. But on the other hand, there were people who uh, welcomed the outcome uh, and in some uh, corners of my region, for example, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, night or the day at the night or the day in their case when um, uh, President Biden or the President-elect Biden was confirmed as President-elect, people were celebrating his victory like uh, to their favorite football team. There were hundreds of uh, people on the street celebrating with American flags uh, and so on and so forth. That speaks about something else. Uh, it speaks about, I would say, um, expectation that uh, US will come back and that US will have a robust involvement in local affairs in some parts of Europe, including uh, Balkans or Southeast Europe or Ukraine. When it comes to US and uh, continental Europe, um, I would have, and I would that not be surprised, uh, if there will be a noticeable change of policy in American foreign policy, something that will be noticeable at the beginning, it will be when it comes to the US-European Union relations and relation between Washington and allies in NATO. I think that uh, Biden will return to more conventional US approach to its European partners and will nurture in all likelihood uh, relations, good relations with Germany and France. I will conclude um, with drawing your attention on Chancellor Merkel's speech uh, a few days ago. Uh, she, in her four minute speech, she talked about German history, Crystal Nacht, the role of the US in post war Germany and post war Europe, and the importance of the strategic partnership between Germany and the US, importance for the US, for Germany, for Europe and the world. I think that's the best, in the best way, encapsulates the way how European partners now see uh, the US. Uh, with the new uh, uh, administration. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's a wonderful review. And one of the things I'll throw into the discussion to pick up at some point is how do elections in general, but this election in particular also influence 
not just the not just how people see the result, but how the image of the U.S. gets changed, strengthened, weakened, morphed uh, as people watch this as closely as what you are describing and 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 and, and translated. Uh, Zoli, view from Africa. Yes, uh, you 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 st- you touched on 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 what has been a nerve for me: the image of the U.S. Uh, during, before, and after these elections. And the, the major thing that came to the fore uh, was discussing with some of the people I spoke to, I, I consulted with different ones, current and, po- uh, and, and former policymakers of, of South Africa in particular, because that's the region I, I, I work on. And of course, I did have conversations with people from elsewhere in Africa. The issue at, uh, in question was democracy. What is democracy? What is that? Because for us, uh, we, we grew up knowing that one man, one vote should, wa- should, should be what democracy stands for. And this whole situation brought a deja vu for, for me when apartheid was a, 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 a subsiding and the, a, the government for the people, by the people was about to take over. And what I was watching happening was had so much similar a, 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 a tendencies with what we had. So people are asking, uh, if we are saying democracy is one man, one vote, what is this system uh, of electoral college system? Uh, because it seems to be confusing to many that I spoke to in Africa, because it seems to make the popular vote play second fiddle to it. And, and so it looks like it, it, it's, a, it's about time it got a attention or review or re- revision of the whole thing. And people were talking about the lack of machinery for f- fast counting, because for a first world country to have its uh, elections on the third and take as long as it did with all the suspense it had to get to where it should go. Well, we don't even know if it has really gotten to where it should go, given all else that we know is going on. So people also talked about the perceived ignorance of leadership I'm saying leadership in, in making it broad. Everybody will know what I'm talking about. That if if a person is ignorant about this electoral system, it, 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 it leaves you wondering. Then how do you lead the nation? Because this is portrayed by the accusations or allegations that have been made, and yet this has been decided upon as the new electoral system where everybody and anybody can vote before time via a, 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 a drop ballot or the mail or in person. And this was underestimated, apparently, so people say in Africa, because it came out with the with the with the. A, unexpected uh, result by the other side that wanted the results to go in a particular way because it, it was not taken seriously. And that has come out to be a, 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 a game changer. It's so it, it appears. And I will say, how does that affect uh, uh, some of the countries I represent? I'll talk about South Africa. I think there is a positive effect because the Johannesburg Stock Exchange started uh, rising a little bit right after the election, which says the world is, is, is gaining from the uh, 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 potential change uh, of government in America. That happened after, after the, the announcement of, of the winning uh, um, uh, pre- president-elect. And then it also escalated when there was a, a, a promise of a vaccine coming up, which means what happens in America impacts the world. And, and people also have spoken a lot about the, the super spreader events effect because they felt if there was strong strength in in governance there should have been something better done than having people all over without masks and risking other people's lives people have been speaking even in social media and in 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 in, in newspapers online and whatever that elsewhere there could be lawsuits uh, by people in certain areas feeling like you are breathing this into the air, into our space, and you are going to affect us all or infect us all. So people felt there is there is there is a little bit of leniency and so on and so forth. But still, they hailed the new electoral system because it has potential to mitigate COVID-19 spread. And it also has, has, has gains for those who paid attention to it. I think that I can stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, in Africa is particularly interesting because there's a lot of, there's a number of elections happening in Africa right now. 
mm-hmm. some delayed, some being talked about. And, and one of the things before I go to Jorge Heine to wrap this round, uh, one of the interesting things that happened on the morning of the 4th was that there was this statement from the embassy in Ivory Coast, which mm. had just had an election saying uh, everyone should remain peaceful and results should be res- uh, sort of respected, et cetera, et cetera. And at least on social media, it became a big thing because this was the morning of the 4th of November. Mm-hmm. And this question of, of, of how democracy is seen, I want to come to that in the next round because it's not just the US. These, these questions about the nature of democracy, I think are global at this point. Uh, and, on, and, 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 and we want to touch on that. But let me first go back to Jorge to give us a view from Latin America, but also as someone who's been across the world in, in senior positions, uh, to, uh, take us to wrap this round. Uh, Jorge, or your mic. I would like to reiterate uh, what has been said before in terms of the tremendous interest this has uh, generated, the US election has generated in Latin America. People are following the details. Uh, they know what uh, a jungle primary means in Georgia, which is not something you would necessarily expect from you know, a Chilean public opinion. So. Yes, it has been said over and over again that this is the most important U.S. election in a generation. Uh, it is certainly seen that way from Latin America, where it has been followed very closely. Special correspondents have been sent from CNN, Chile, to Washington and elsewhere to cover it in great detail. That's number one. Number two, uh, looking around and, and gathering opinions of people, following various social media accounts and so on, there is, in, in as a rule, a great uh, relief that uh, Joe Biden has won the election. Uh, Latin America, you could, you could argue, was uh, in many ways, uh, you know, um, under relentless uh, pressure during the uh, Trump years in so many ways. Mexico, Central America, Cuba, uh, Venezuela, Haiti, even Puerto Rico, that is part of uh, the United States, but you know, is uh, Hispanic. Uh, got its uh, share of admission during these years, making thus for a very complex and and difficult relationship. Let me tell you a little story. There is something called the Summit of the Americas that meets every three or four years, whose sole purpose is to get the US president to meet with its Latin American counterparts. Latin American presidents meet among them all the time so much so that the the agenda runs out. They don't have anything more to talk about and sometimes leave early because, you know, enough is enough. But they don't get very many opportunities to meet with the U.S. president. And that was the reason this was established as far back as 1994. Well, uh, the Summit of the Americas was held in Lima, Peru in April of 2018. Um, President Trump had announced he would go. All the arrangements were made and a couple of weeks before the meeting, he said, no, he is not going. So Vice President Pence was sent instead. And in the official program that was distributed of Vice President Pence's visit to Lima, it said in writing, a dinner with President Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, who no longer was the president of Peru at that point in time. So that particular agenda had to be changed. Now, I tell this as an illustration of the kind of diplomatic treatment that uh, Latin America has gotten uh, these years. Now, this general relief and the governmental reaction that we have seen from most governments in the region congratulate President Biden and looking forward to a new phase in the relationship with the United States has two exceptions, as you know, which happen to be the two biggest countries in the region neither the Mexican government nor the Brazilian government has said anything so far. Uh, And, uh, you know, this is not a good thing. In the case of Brazil, this has been taken uh, to the limit. Uh, President uh, Bolsonaro, who likes to refer to himself as Trump of the tropics, seems particularly upset with uh, President-elect Biden's plans to do something about climate change and the possibility that uh, sanctions might be applied on Brazil if they don't stop the burning down of the Amazon forest. And um, a few days ago, President Bolsonaro was quoted as saying, well, if saliva is not enough, 
gunpowder will do, uh, which is not necessarily something you would expect from um, you know, one head of state referring to the president-elect of the United States. So we may be in for a bit of a rocky period in US-Brazilian relations, but by and large with uh, most of the rest of the region, which is right now undergoing uh, what ECLAC, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean has referred to as the most serious crisis in a hundred years. Latin America has uh, 400,000 COVID deaths, which is 30% of the world's COVID deaths, but only 8% of the population. This is four times what it should have uh, according to normal distribution. So the situation is very dire. It is expected that this year, uh, GDP will fall by 8%, which would be the uh, worst performance of any region in the world. So things are really bad. And uh, people are looking forward to a different kind of relationship with uh, the Biden administration and very much looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a wonderful sort of round the world view of things. And I wanted to throw at least one question and, and anyone can pick it up or, or I can, but, but one of the things is uh, while you've mentioned the general sentiment, the, we have also seen a lot of interesting support for Mr. Trump. It's not as been as if everyone is, is, has, has a position. And Manjri talked about uh, many in India, in Asia, I heard again and again, sort of this, this idea that, well, he didn't go to war, uh, meaning Trump. Uh, and so it's not as if uh, sort of there is a general consensus in, in the world. But the question I wanted to say with the regard to that was, there is a lot of political turmoil all across the world. And one of the things that had become fashionable is to compare different leaders to Mr. Trump. In some ways, he'd become kind of the archetype of this sort of Twitter handling, a very different type of, of, of politician uh, who might have encouraged that sort of politics elsewhere or discouraged it because people didn't like it. How do you see that happening around the world? Sort of how do you see people looking at the results, not just in terms of foreign policy, but in terms of domestic politics and the style of politics that might come. Maybe I'll, I'll just say, Eric, but then anyone can join in because sort of Boris Johnson is again one of those sort of not, not uh, the usual type of politicians. Yes, I mean, interestingly, I mean, after Trump's election uh, four years ago, and I, was, I spent a lot of time in the UK, uh, I kept encountering a lot of people who admired President Trump. They saw in him a strong leader with a clear view. It tied in with a certain isolationist British Brexiteer view, but it was similar against immigration, uh, against too much economic integration, against globalization, uh, uh, climate issues being negative about that. Uh, and so there was a, a thread there in this more general populist uh, movement that was beginning to sort of take off at that point. It's had implications in other parts of uh, Europe as well, such as Hungary, uh, Prime Minister Orban. So there is actually, a, I think, quite a significant Trumpist uh, a factor out there that he sort of uh, personifies. And is. Uh, it will be interesting to watch, particularly with Boris Johnson, who so carefully identified with him, almost down to the hair, uh, to sort of do a, a Trumpian image, uh, how they're going to adjust to the fact that there has been uh, this mm -hmm. defeat. Uh, and I also just want to pick up on one of their issues that happened. Uh, one of the things that the BBC particularly did in its uh, world coverage of this was to point out the scale of the American election, the number of people involved, and that this ultimately was a peaceful election for all of the eccentricities that every country actually has in its election system, uh, and that you know President Biden emerges. So there's an interesting sort of tension there between the Trumpian group and ultimately the fact that uh, Biden clearly did win a popular victory. So that's also, uh, I think, a key factor in all of this. I mean, can I jump in? Please do, but let me please before that uh, add that those who are watching, and thank you for watching, we have a good number of people watching, do please write up questions if you have any, and, and we would be, we would love to take your questions. So please write them in the comment. Uh, Jorge. Yes. Now, obviously, uh, you have such a situation and the, the, you know, different people view uh, President Trump in different ways. But, you know, we do have, there's something called Pew Research, and, you know, they do polling. 
And, uh, you know, I was looking at the latest in September and the U.S. favorab favorability ratings, which is one way of looking at it, have been to at all time lows. You know, in the UK, it's at 41%, which is the lowest it has ever been since they started measuring. In France, it's at 31%. In Germany, it's at 23%. Now, if you ask another question, um, how much would you trust a given leader with the handling of world affairs? President Trump gets lower um, you know, um, polling numbers than President Xi, President Putin, Boris Johnson, Macron, Merkel, you know. It's, so, I mean, there's some evidence out there that uh, U.S. favorability ratings and trust in the United States in the course of the past few years has declined considerably. And that, it seems to me, explains the relatively widespread reaction uh, of relief around the world uh, at the election of Joe Biden. Well, Manji, can I can I ask you same question if you wish, but also to link to what Zoli had said earlier about not just the image of the country, but of elections. You know, every time there is, for example, an election in India, the news stories are about how big it is, and you use camels, and it takes days. So India is, for example, used to complex elections, and the complexity of the election was itself a news item this time. Was there reaction to that? Was there comment on that? And if so, what? Um, yeah, I'll take that last part first, actually. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, and I actually listened with great interest to what Zoli said about um, African perceptions of US elections. So in, uh, the, in India, there was certainly a certain level of bemusement because in India, elections take time. Everybody knows this, right? So uh, in, in 2019, India's general elections happened in like seven phases. It took over a month, and then it took about a week after that uh, before uh, Indians uh, knew who the winner was. Um, and, you know, 900, it's like almost like 900 million Indians turn out to vote. So voter participation is extremely high in India. So it hovers around between 67 to like 70%. I mean, those are numbers that in the US are considered astonishing. Uh, but in India, it's, it's, it's you know, it, there's always a massive turnout. Um, and despite corruption, uh, you know, Indian elections are generally free and fair. Um, and, you know, election, election rules mean that every voter, every single voter um, uh, needs to be able to access a voting booth uh, within, I think, two kilometers of where they live, right? So when India transitioned to electronic voting, um, there was actually a story I read uh, of a, a voting booth that was set up in the Gir Forest in Gujarat for one voter. Right, which is really stark contrast to the calls here to roll back voting and roll back, you know, ballot drop-offs. Uh, so in India, the, the focus is very much on expanding access uh, to voting for everybody. So there was certainly a level of amusement with that because inst uh, election results are never instant, right? And and people know that. Uh, so uh, this, the as as you pointed out, Adil, the electoral college adds that layer of complexity that people have to grasp, um, uh, you know, uh, and so they look at it with with puzzlement. Um, in terms of in terms of President Trump and and his popularity, um, uh, what Jorge said was also really interesting because so on one hand, President Trump is very popular in India. He is, but then so was President Obama, right? He was also a very popular U.S. president, and so uh, I think that correlates with U.S. Uh, with generally positive views of the United States in India, which can be seen from Pew Research polls. But interestingly, uh, as, as Jorge pointed out, uh, you know, the Pew Research polls also tell a more complicated story than we think. So if you look at Pew Research polls, they find that support for President Trump is higher among Hindu nationalists than among uh, you know, the uh, general population, right? And of course, that speaks to both uh, President Trump and Prime Minister Modi's ability uh, to fire up their nationalist base uh, based on uh, their policies towards Muslims, based on their policies towards immigration, um, on identity politics, et cetera. So there's that nuance that comes in. Uh, Besco, before I go to Zoli, I do want to ask her something about sort of the social dimension of this election, and, and you can also maybe talk about it, but in, in, in Europe, when people were following these elections, as you say, unlike ever before, why do you think they were doing it? Because, because it was Mr. Trump, or because interest in the US has gone up, or because the issues are becoming more parallel? 
Uh, how do you explain this heightened interest in this particular election, which I think was global? I would say that uh, uh, I think that some of you already mentioned it, that uh, the vision within the U.S. very much mirrors the vision in the EU, uh, uh, many European states over issues like uh, liberalism, populism, nationalism, um, and uh, and Trump has become uh, a vocal supporter of, of um, various types of uh, uh, populist movements in Europe. Or better said, they saw Trump as a role model for their uh, for their narratives or for their type of governments or something that they wanted to implement to apply in uh, European states. I will not mention now countries, but you know that the number of countries from Central Europe or Eastern Europe including one big between Germany and, and, uh, and Russia, they actually um, uh, uh, copied uh, some policies uh, implemented by Trump's administration um, in, in, uh, their, in their homes. No, but this doesn't conclude the, the list. Uh, looking, uh, if you look at the Western Europe, Western Europe, let's say the, the traditional European liberal democracies, uh, you can uh, acknowledge uh, the rise of populism and nationalism in those countries. Uh, Macron for the uh, European elections last year, uh, elections for European Parliament, lost in France. So he is a president and many don't see this, but uh, don't, didn't see, didn't notice in the US that he lost elections for European Parliament, lost elections to um, uh, nationalist movements uh, or nationalist movement, not the nationalist movement in the in France. That speaks about how uh, uh, Trump narratives, uh, his rhetorics um, resonates well with uh, with uh, people, uh, some type of policies in Europe. But I will, if I may add one more thing here, since we are speaking about those who leaders who didn't congratulate, I, did, I can't but mention Putin. Putin didn't and uh, official Moscow didn't yet congratulate Biden for the, for the victory. Um, I would not say that Russians love Trump, but they love Trump or they consider Trump better than some other uh, American politicians. Uh, Speaking about few possible future uh, relationship between those two countries, with Biden in place, I would say uh, I was reading a couple of articles a couple of days ago in Moscow Times in some uh, Russian news. So many or most people, experts expect to have a more predictable uh, traditional type of relations between uh, U.S. and Russia, this will, uh, relations that will uh, be unfolding within parameters of well-established, well-established practice, which, in my view, is not a bad thing. Uh, at least we will know how to play in that game, which has been played by two countries for many years. Uh, when it comes to Trump, uh, he several times tried to rehabilitate uh, Putin. For example, trying to uh, call him back to join G7 group or so on and so forth. Uh, I would say why uh, why Russians or Moscow can be worried about uh, is worried about is the fact that uh, Democrats by default are more critical about human rights and democracy issues in Russia. And I would say uh, with this particular administration, uh, since Biden was vice president during Obama presidency. They may expect change in the approach towards uh, Ukraine, and therefore I think uh, that may be uh, worrisome for them. Thank you. And you've already begun answering one of the questions we got from um, uh, someone watching online. Fares is, you know, what might be the first indications of changes that we might see in a, in a Biden administration? What are the first earliest things he might do in world affairs? Maybe I can very quickly, a two-line answer from each one of you, starting with you, Zoli, maybe. Uh, what do you expect will change for the world uh, with the change in president? Uh, your microphone, please. One would hope that the rhetoric that we have learned to live with, with the pre previous regime, especially with reference to Africa. Everybody knows what he called us as countries. And uh, the hope is with the current 
Okay, one would hope that with the current regime, there would be better respect for other nations and, the, and, and, and their uh, autonomy because uh, uh, the world looks up to the, the United States. I mean, if we have issues uh, with, uh, or even before issues show up with our own elections, the United States is likely to send observers to try and bring a balance and equilibrium. If there is gonna be no balance and no equilibrium in the very place that uh, is the superpower to help the, the other places of the world, that's, that's a problem. I will also add that I did not mention that the South African president did uh, congratulate uh, President Biden with the hope that there will be a harmonious coexistence and working together uh, towards economy. Even though uh, President Trump uh, uh, had this uh, unsavory uh, 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 rhetoric towards Africa, uh, at some point he hailed Ramaphosa because Ramaphosa is a businessman. And so he, 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 he mentioned that he thought they would work better together because they are both from the business world. If that ever came to fruition, no one is so sure. I am not sure I'll put it that way. So the hope is henceforth there may be a, the, the, the desired a, a interaction between autonomous countries, be they developed or developing. And I'll, I, to the others, one line, what was the first things you might see change? I'll throw in mine. I think, uh, you know, on the 4th, actually, 4th of November, the US technically walked out of the Paris Accord on climate. I have a feeling that on day one, Biden will actually say we are coming back because in some ways it's an easy thing to do. It's something that a president can do. I don't think there will be a new green deal as quickly or even ever uh, because it will be politically difficult, but Paris I think might return. Eric, what would be your candidate for something we could see? A very volatile world. I think the key thing that's going to happen is stability and people will be able to see the stability. The president will be out of the news uh, more than currently, that's a good thing because there's a work to be done. And I think also it's gonna be seen that there has been no American president in, uh, in I, I think ever with as much experience of foreign affairs because of his long political life, understanding of the global issues. And I think that's gonna be reflected in how the US can provide stability in what is a very sort of always volatile world, particularly volatile at the moment. I, I, I think so too, but hold, hold your, hold your, fasten your seat belts. You may have an ex-president that remains in the news uh, because you might have an ex-president who is very good at knowing the art of staying in the news. But Manjuri, what would be your candidate of, of um, what we might see? I think we will uh, definitely see a return of expertise. So um, uh, the Biden administration, you can see it even with the coronavirus team he has assembled. Uh, there will definitely be a rehiring across the board of people who left uh, the US government in droves under the Trump administration. I think uh, that this is an administration that very much relies on epistemic communities or like communities of specialists. Um, again, something that the Trump administration uh, uh, did, not, uh, did not kind of disdained. Um, I also think there'll be a return of the interagency process by which foreign policy decision is, make, is made in the US administration, uh, where um, I believe that foreign policy now is much more ad hoc and even entrepreneurial, rather than wending its way up through uh, bureaucracy and the series of meetings that had been in place under many administrations. Um, finally, I think that, uh, uh, as you pointed out, Adil, uh, President Biden will rejoin many institutions. I simply cannot see uh, the United States withdrawing from the WHO next year uh, under President Biden. Jorge, what might the world notice in terms of change? Uh, your microphone, please. A return to, a return to the world, uh, multilateralism. And you know, you know the saying, Half the job is showing up. President Trump has never visited Africa in his four years. He only visited Latin America once for a G20 meeting in Buenos Aires. Well, you know, those signals are there. You know, Bismarck famously said, diplomacy is about making friends abroad. Well, if you don't show up, you're hardly going to make any friends. And that, it seems to me, is something that Joe Biden will do. Vesco? Um very similar, very similar views uh, with my colleagues. I would say that Biden will have a, a, a challenge to strike balance between uh, 
the interest or the need to be more involved in the world affairs at the same time uh, to reflect on what is still um, popular uh, views in the U.S. To, uh, not to be overly involved uh, in world affairs. So uh, I'm sure that uh, that will be for, for his administration when it comes to foreign policy, one of the biggest challenges uh, to, to play in between those two poles uh, in the future. Uh, definitely, I agree with my colleagues, more predictability, more co coherency, more, co you know, uh, uh, when it comes to European Union, as I already said, and NATO allies, uh, we will see the traditional uh, policy, traditional approach uh, based on cooperation rather than feuds uh, between um, uh, those who I think by nature should cooperate uh, uh, closely. My, my colleagues are obviously on the hopeful, optimistic side. So let me take that question that was asked by Fez and turn it on its head for all of you. In, in we, we have a few minutes, so I, I want to go through a couple of rounds of questions. Again, very quick round. What do you expect not to change? Meaning, what are the type of things that Mr. Trump has done which will stick, that may not be easy to change? I, I'll throw some headlines and you can react to them. Iran. Um, Afghanistan, uh, North Korea, uh, China, uh, the Middle East, but what are the, or, or visas, <laughs> um, closing borders, what are the type of things that, that, that might actually stick and become Mr. Trump's uh, foreign policy legacy in, 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 in the long term? Anyone wants to take, uh, Jorge, can I call on you? Sure. Well, you know, I would, if I, if I were a betting man, I think you we're, are. <laughs> we're going to see some changes with Iran. Uh, I think we're going to see some changes with China. I think the rhetoric will be different. We will not see, I would venture to say, this effort to sort of exacerbate the contradictions, um, as it were, uh, which is all um, to the good. I would also I think we will see a change in this um, approach to visas that you mentioned, something that has run counter, uh, you know, very much against the interest of U.S. business and many activities. Um, so I think we're going to see quite a few changes in the areas that you mentioned. On, on North Korea, I would say, well, how much has really changed uh, under the Trump administration? Not very much. So, you know, <laughs> I would expect the status quo they are to go on. Manju? So I think that um, President Trump took a hawkish turn towards China uh, that I don't think is going to go back under President Biden. I think that will actually continue. Um, and a similar vein, I think that the last four years resulted in such a strong strategic partnership with India. I think President Biden will absolutely continue that as well. Uh, Eric, maybe what will not change? Perhaps not that uh, excitingly, but very critical. Uh, trade policies are not going to change a great deal. Uh, the NAFTA agreement was renegotiated under President Trump. That trade relationship with Canada and Mexico is pretty much going to stay the same. And the disinclination to pursue free trade or free trade type agreements isn't going to return. That's where they actually share some with similar policies. On Afghanistan, if President Trump removes troops from Afghanistan, in the next few weeks, which is being rumored at the moment, I doubt the Biden administration would reinsert them afterwards. Zoli? I'm thinking what was started in Israel may not easily be just reversed like that uh, uh, in the Biden uh, uh, um, uh, administration. I hope though that what uh, has been done with immigration, especially with relation to Africa may change. I, I cannot say it will not change because I don't wish for it not to change. Mm -hmm. And Vesco? Uh, I would say, I would, I would confirm or reiterate what uh, my colleague Manjari said. I don't expect the policy towards China to be changed. Maybe at the rhetorical level, rhetor rhetorics will be changed, but policy will not be changed. I would say that policy, um, uh, pivot to Asia, was established with Biden administration, so uh, uh, with, uh, with Obama's administration, sorry. So the Biden, Biden will follow that logic. What would not be changed if I come back to Europe is that uh, in, uh, 
insistence on the spending of defense spending uh, among European allies. But again, it is not what uh, uh, President Trump instituted. Uh, it was uh, something which was uh, put forward uh, long before President Trump. So I think that Biden uh, will continue insisting, Biden administration will continue insisting on more spending on defense among European allies. So I want one last question that I want to go around as we end. But before that, I see a question from uh, Christina Khalife, who's one of our students. And so I, I don't want to miss that. Maybe I'll pose that to Jorge. Um, she's asking about what about the economy? What about tax cuts? What about the economy? In some ways, Mr. Biden has been given a tough hand, uh, you know, coming in the midst of a coronavirus revival, economy in a dire state. Should one be expecting changes either in the economy in general or in economic policy? Well, that's a great question. What a lot of people are saying is that uh, we should not expect too much from uh, President-elect Biden foreign policy because he will be consumed by the challenges at home, uh, the pandemic and the economy above all. So um, I would think that the economy would be a central priority in his policy. And perhaps we might see uh, finally this big infrastructure plan that various presidents have been promising to the United States and that will spruce up the airports, bridges, tunnels, of this country that need it uh, so badly. I would think that would be a, a great opportunity. It would in inject money and dynamism into the economy and would repair the infrastructure of the United States that is uh, badly needed. Thank you. So one last question as we end, this has been an immensely, immensely educative conversation, certainly for me. So we've talked about Biden and Trump and policy. I want to go back to elections and the question, and maybe I'll start with you, Eric, and then go to everyone. The question I want to ask is, you know, we are policy wonks, if you will. You know, we, we study these things. We, we glue ourselves to televisions. When people around the world saw this election, 2020, those who don't follow it that closely, what do you think surprised them the most? What, what do you think sort of they found most either interesting, amusing, surprising, different? Uh, I'll come to everyone, but maybe Eric, I can start with you. Okay. Well, the BBC had a great deal of fun with the last press conference of the uh, Trump administration as the, uh, uh, the election was called being held in the car park of the Four Seasons Landscaping uh, Center. And that is possibly its most visited video uh, at the moment. So there was some lighthearted fun there. Uh, but I think the takeaway lesson was that for all of the uh, uh, storm and fury that seemed to be around the, the news coverage, the country had an election. And it's going through a transition of government and also on the counting issue. And Mandra was touching on the speed of elections. There were thousands of elections on election day. Uh, and I think people did understand generally that this was actually a big election. It just wasn't one election, one office being held. And I think it's always something that I remember my students when I, I taught overseas were always struck by the fact in the end, the people do vote. And that's a significant takeaway. It's a very important point. Hey. Zuli, you had your hand up. Okay. No, what, what I thought was interesting for people mostly is the, what shall I say, instability of what they thought was stable. Over the years, you would watch the numbers. You are just waiting for 270 to show up. Now 270 showed up and seemingly nothing was stable, if you see what I mean. We have over 270. Still today, there are uncertainties. There is no 100% said government that is running a, 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 of the of, of the president elect. So people were shocked that, oh, even this electoral college that we thought was something that drives this country is not necessarily that. Yeah. Good, good point, but I, I, if I can add a Pakistan sort of view of, while that sort of thing came up, what's also come up is, you know, that talk of violence on the street, sort of guns out there also did not happen. So mm -hmm. that debate even with the 270 happens on the screen, it happens in the court. You know, this is very unusual, but even in its unusualness, it is not the usual that is elsewhere when, when elections are contested. And, and we, we are still in the process, so we'll see, but Jorge. Yes, I think what has surprised people the most, you know, in, in Chile and Latin America in general, there's great admiration for the US democratic system its constitution, its laws, and so on, but also its norms. 
Um, and I think the biggest surprise there has been the delay in conceding the election and how long it has taken. And that is something that has really uh, shocked me because it was so uh, unexpected and instilled. I, I think, again, that's an important point because in, for many of uh, people outside the U.S., that conceding part has always been one of the highlights that is unusual. The, the grace with which it usually happens is very often talked after the election, okay, this is special about the system because that's not something that always happens elsewhere with the same sort of speed or grace, but, but that certainly has been a surprise. Vesco, looking from Europe, what surprised people? Uh, I will try not to uh, repeat what my colleagues have said, but I would point out two things. First thing is that somebody who with a gun can show up uh, and cast their votes, uh, that something like that is uh, uh, unbelievable in Europe because that person will be arrested immediately by police uh, and the polling station will be closed. Uh, so this is one thing. Uh, you, have, you have a problem to explain people that is something which may happen and is acceptable in the US. But secondly, second thing more important, I would say, the fact that president of, the, of a country, which means in this case, president of the US, questions legitimacy of the elections mm -hmm. uh, in which he took part, because it speaks about something which is uh, very well known in countries in transition, in democratic transition, my, my, former, my country and countries from Eastern Europe, where uh, those who participate in election afterwards challenge uh, uh, legitimacy of elections. And it always goes around the same narrative or the same uh, argumentation. You either question a uh, process before you decide to participate asking for some, uh, let's say, uh, uh, adaptation to what of the process, which means either um, uh, change of law or um, uh, introducing new practices uh, in order to make process more transparent or not. When pro once you participate in the process, uh, it means that you accepted legitimacy of that process. Uh, and then in this case, it's not just about questioning results in one particular place. It's a question of uh, the process as such, uh, which is something that the people cannot understand. Thank you. And Manjri, you get the last word. What surprised people, you think? Well, um, I'm not going to make a sweeping statement because, uh, you know, I, I am very data driven and I don't have data, but I will tell you that um, anecdotally speaking, um, I, one of the things that I got texts from friends about, and this has been uh, not just during the U.S. elections, but even in the run up is about the feistiness of the American press which has been uh, something that people have very much been surprised and appreciated that the, the, you know, the, the head to head, uh, toe to toe, uh, which the US press has gone with President Trump. Um, and uh, the fact that they, they've gotten uh, uh, more and more candid in, in describing uh, what they think is his mendacity um, has been amazingly surprising to people even in democracies. Uh, where uh, press has been more deferential and has even at times faced pushback and been muzzled, uh, not just by uh, government, but also by the public, uh, which may object to such categorizations. So the, the, the true freedom of press that exists in the US is really a wonder that has been noted upon uh, anecdotally by several people I know. Thank you. Thank you for that, that again, sort of that, that, that wonderful journey through a lot of things in a short period of time. My gratitude to all of you for, for not just joining us, but for, uh, for very insightful uh, uh, comments and, and covering a large set of things. My gratitude to those who have been watching, to those who will be watching. This is one of our, uh, one of our many, many, many events and things that are happening at Boston University trying to understand this election. There will be another one uh, organized by our Center for European Studies, I believe on the 23rd of December. But I imagine that this conversation is going to continue uh, well after that, this this election technically is still not 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 uh, you know the, the president doesn't next president doesn't come till the twentieth of January, uh, and I expect that the uh, excitement as well as anticipation that we've seen in the election process is not going to subside after that. I think we remain. Um, in line for a turbulent world for a while. So keep your seatbelts fastened. 
and, and do visit us often here at the party school as we continue to make sense of what is happening in the world. Thank you very much, Manjri. Thank you very much, Jorge, Zoli, Vesco, Eric, and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah,